My pleasure to be here with Rabbi Dr. Ariel Evan Mays, who received his doctorate in Jewish studies from Harvard University, his smicha from Beit Midrash Harel, um, and currently uh, serves at the Stanford University faculty as an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies, where he was previously at, um, at Hebrew College in Newton, Massachusetts. Thanks for taking time to talk. It's a great honor to be here, Shmuley. So, um, <clears throat> to start, uh, how, how do you see the type of influence you'd like to have within the academic world? Um, meaning, how do you uh, see, see yourself uh, moving things forward? And also, how do you see yourself influenced, positively or negative, by that culture as well? There are a lot of wonderful things about the academic culture, a sense of intensity in trying to find out what a text really means and how ideas change over time and the philo philological sensibility of understanding how texts speak to one another have a lot to offer us. Um, it's also a very complicated place, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, what I write, I generally write for different audiences in different ways. I, I change my tone, I change the footnotes, I'm, I'm offering different things to different audiences, and I'm mindful of that. Um, one of my teachers told me that every time you sit down to write a piece, think about who's your audience and what conversation are you hoping to enter. And I think about that a lot when I'm sitting down to write a piece, whether it's for a more theologically minded journal or for more an academically minded journal, both the way that I present the text and the ultimate point that I'm trying to make change with both of those things. Um, on the other hand, especially in my teaching, I see myself as an integrated person. I don't have a theological self and an academic self, and I allow them to speak to one another and ultimately to produce an, an intellectual project in which I hope that those two are integrated, if, per not, if perhaps not in a seamless way, way um, in a way where they actually involve one another and give to one another. But when I teach, I can't teach totally differently. I'm a, I'm a single human being. And I teach from the heart. Um, I teach from the heart in the academic setting, and I teach from the heart in a more religious or, um, or theological context as well. Um, in a religious or theological context, I want to get my, my students a sense of the excitement of academic study and what it means to be a scholar. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in the academic setting, I also try and ask my students, well, why does this matter? What are the eternal questions of the spirit that this, quest, this text, this thinker, this idea is engaging with? And it's not simply about the critical apparatus that you can wrap around the text, but what ideas throb and pulse in the very heart of the text? And then what, te what claims can that text make of us as people sitting around the table in the 21st century? Um, there are conventions in academia of scholarly tenor and scholarly distance, um, which I find to be very useful in terms of thinking about the text with rigor. On the other hand, there's a kind of turn in academia, especially in, uh, in our generation, away from plumbing for the big ideas and looking for a kind of uh, subjective reading of the text or a kind of conceptual acrobatics that I find um, very disheartening and I run away from whenever I can. And so I try and take the best of what academia has to offer. And this was the gift of my teachers, both of whom are both um, involved in the religious world and who are also deeply invested in the academic project, um, which is to take all of the things that academia has to give to us, to take them and to use them in the way that we, uh, that we educate our students in religious contexts as well. Mm -hmm. So w what are some of the boundaries you recognize um, in the academic world, for better or worse, that may prevent authentic expression mm -hmm. in teaching or mentoring in ways that you think would be most powerful? We taught for four years at a seminary in Israel, and <clears throat> the students there came with an expectation that they would connect to their students in soulful ways. And the student, I'm sorry, the students came there with an expectation that they would connect to their teachers in a, in a soulful manner. And they were ready for that, and they would um, immediately open up in all of those ways. Sometimes it took a little bit of conversation, but they were primed for that kind of encounter. Um, it's not always self-understood that students in academia are interested in that. Mm -hmm. And as my, when I have my professorial hat on, it's not my job. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't change the fact that I can engage with them as whole human beings, not simply as a mind across the table, mm -hmm. but as a human being. Mm -hmm. 
And there are ways of phrasing questions and of asking questions of the text and of them that allow me to get beyond that kind of distinction mm -hmm. between a religious or a, uh, uh, an academic setting. Um, in terms of the way that I write about academic, uh, I write academic scholarship, um, I don't write in the we, um, and that, that, uh, that tone or that distance is something that is actually critical for being able to make my argument. Um, on the other hand, the ability to channel these religious thinkers and make them come alive while still maintaining that sense of di distance, it's a kind of sympathy without occluding myself and the person that I'm writing about, gives academic writing a kind of passionate fire mm -hmm. that makes the ideas come to life in a different way. Mm -hmm. And students recognize that when you're teaching the text and you really care about them. Mm -hmm. They can tell very quickly whether or not you are deeply invested in this material. What, what do you think are some of the opportunities for a, a deeper relationship between academic Jewish studies and contemporary Jewish spirituality? The depth of scholarship that academia has to offer, um, so much of contemporary Jewish spirituality is not grounded in texts. It's bound it's about experiences, it's about this, it's about that, it's about a lot of wonderful things, and I'm all for those things. But it, it sometimes it, it pays the price. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who's committed to intellectual history and to the study of religions, I think that there's so much to be gained from putting Jewish texts in dialogue with other great thinkers from other religious traditions, not in the syncretist attempt to bring them all together, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but an attempt to understand how do devotional languages speak to one another. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that the kind of knowledge that, um, and sharpened knowledge that academic scholarship at its best brings to the table is something that contemporary spiritual thinkers and seekers can benefit from. Um, on the other hand, it can't be a kind of arid scholarship. It has to be one that is deeply engaged. Um, Kafka drew a famous distinction, <clears throat> which was actually done by the Kabbalists many years before him, between the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. Now, if I woke you up in the middle of the night and I asked you how many trees and there were in the Garden of Eden, you would say, a bunch, right? But there were two of those. Um, and Kafka said, what if there was only one tree? And the Kabbalists themselves say this, that there was only one tree, and the tree of life can be the tree of life or it can be the tree of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, if you separate one from the other, you have rent asunder the, mm -hmm. the link between two elements of the divine, between the human and the divine, and you have raised um, knowledge to a pedestal that puts it on the same level as idolatry. If your knowledge is in the service of life, in terms of the tree of life, in terms of the spirit mm -hmm. and life, capital L, of all being, mm -hmm. then the tree of knowledge is infused with that ethos. So that, that one fundamental tree is transformed based on that relationship. Depending on how you look at it, it's a right, Janus-based right. tree. Right, right, beautiful. So I think my last question for you is, how do you see um, ethical and religious voices being used in, in the academic world, particularly in the study of religion, that you see as really positive examples um, that others might build off of. Yeah. It's not in, <clears throat> in professional Jewish studies and in religious studies, it's not my job to judge the veracity of an, of an experience, the veracity of a text, the veracity of an idea. That's not what I'm out to prove to my students. Yeah. I proved to, to them that there are ways of reading this text in dialogue with other texts or on its own, depending on what we're doing. Um, but to cast moral judgments on the text is not something that I'm supposed to be doing. And yet, on the other hand, um, I am very aware of the fact that I teach religious studies mm -hmm. at a great institution of higher learning that doesn't have a divinity school. We have a wonderful department of philosophy, we have a wonderful ethics center, but I also feel a profound sense of obligation for there to be a moral and ethical voice coming out of religious studies. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of how these texts inform the way that we live our lives as contemporary human beings. That obviously has to do with my own liberal agenda, but it has to do with the way that I've allowed these texts over many, many, many years to shape and to form me and to influence the, the vision that I hope to share with the world. And if it's not judging between this is good religion and that is bad religion and my religion is good religion and your religion is bad religion, um, that's almost a straw man for thinking about the way that these texts can be mobilized um, to both offer something 
to the contemporary world and to make make very profound demands of us in yeah. the contemporary world. Yeah, yeah. Um, Rabbi Dr. Ariel Evan Mays, check out his uh, his works. He has a book coming out. You want to tell us uh, about this book you're co-editing that's on its way out? So I'm co-editing a book together with my teacher, Arthur Green, called A New Hasidism, Roots and Branches. It's in two volumes. Um, the first volume is key think key writings from um, neo-Hasidic thinkers from the 19th and early tw- and uh, 20th century. The second volume are a series of essays by contemporary neo-Hasidic thinkers tackling a whole way- wide range of issues. Um, the goal in this project is to bring together all of these disparate strands of neo-Hasidism and to think together with the reader, what is this movement, what is it, and what does it have to offer to the contemporary world? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Keep up the amazing work as a scholar and thinker and leader of a really important one of our times. So thank you so much.